What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Real Estate Uncensored. We have a great guest with us today. We brought back Chris Noggle. We are talking about, do the rich get richer? And spoiler alert, they do. But the question is, can you uh, actually emulate what they're doing that's going to get you richer too over the uh, the course of the next six months? And we're going to talk about why the rich get richer, which uh, both the good and the bad, because I think this is going to be a fun conversation to get into. So we'll bring Chris in in a second. But first, my illustrious, esteemed colleague, the uh, the junior grandmasters in the co-pilot seat, Greg McDaniel. What's up with you today? You forgot handsome and intelligent, Matt. We've talked about this show. We did practiced so many times. Fuck you. Yes, you did. <laughs> um, now this is going to be a great show. I've had Chris. Guys, you remember Chris coming on uh, about a couple, about, what about a month ago, right? Two months ago, yeah. Two like months that. ago. Well, I actually did an interview with Chris uh, for Inman News, uh, which oh, we're going to awesome. have to reshoot because I was having the world's worst internet day ever. <laughs> it was horrible. But the knowledge bombs he dropped, you guys. He already has one book out, you know, the Private Money Guide, and he has another book out that he, he he's going to talk about. But it's just. I really want you to lock in your brains because what you're going to actually learn here is something you probably haven't heard of. If you have heard of it before, it's insanity. You've been lied to your entire life. You just don't know it. Mm -hmm. So Chris, you're going to crush it. Bald Ninja, the evil bald ninja. What is that, brother? What up, Playboy? How Speaking you living? Speaking of handsome devil, what's up, man? That's yeah. great. Matt Johnson <laughs> always coming with the knowledge. That was pretty good. Cool. <laughs> How you guys making out today? I love Fridays. Oh, it's good, man. We yes. uh, we watched a very dumb video that you decided to show us, and don't repeat the name of it. Uh, pre pre show, and uh, we are we have all kind of had that look on our face. We're like, what are we watching? Yeah, I mean, just just FYI to anyone watching and or listening, I swear between the between the four of us, we lost a combined thousand <laughs> brain cells. Just <laughs> at least, I think at least, least. <laughs> at least. So if we if we screw up or if we just like you know freeze up and fall off of our chairs at some point, that's that would be why. So. <laughs> But uh, let's let's officially welcome in Chris Noggle, the host of Real Estate Money School and uh, the author of all the books that Greg just mentioned. What's up today? Not much. Glad to be here. I definitely do feel a little bit more intelligent now that we've started after watching that video. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like you got to kick it. It's like a motorcycle. When it dies, you got to you got to kick it. You got to kick it again and get it started. Yeah, that's uh, that's what we got to do with our brains like right we, now. We're, we're running again here. We're oh, running. goodness. All right. <laughs> I, I really don't think it's fair that you're leaving that to the people's imagination. I mean, you're talking oh, about this no, video. It's and very no. fair. It, believe me, we're improving people's lives by not referencing yes. that video. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I think the only part of that video we could talk about are the kitty cats. Yeah, yes, the tiger. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Oh my God! All right, let's start with this. Um, we'll get to, uh, so Chris. For those that don't know you, or maybe lived under a rock and uh, didn't catch your last episode, just give us the bullet point version: who you are, where you are, what you do, and then I've got a question for you. Sure. Uh, just a ex pro snowboarder, ex TV show guy that uh, flipped a lot of houses from Buffalo, New York, um, commonly known as America's number one money mentor, and I solve your money problem. Here's your sign. <laughs> Here's your sign. Here's your sign. <laughs> All right. Love it. All right. So um, let's talk about investing just for a quick hot second. Is there, if you were forced uh, at gunpoint, because I know it's not where you would necessarily put your money right now, but let's say, let's say you were forced at gunpoint to put your money into the stock market right now. What is one sector that you think is just in trouble? You wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. You wouldn't put any money there. Something bad's about to happen. Uh, any particular sector jump out to you? Yeah, it already happened. It's called retail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you mean as the juggernaut that. that is Amazon <laughs> continues to make billions in profits? Yeah. 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 That, that would be the one. Main yeah. retail stores, your, your brick and mortars, I would run, 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 run. And that's just one little thing. I mean, yeah. You'd have a hard time getting me to put money into regular stocks right now, period. Hey, quick quick question. There was something that came up. Uh, Greg, we talked about this with our guest last week on the show, and she mentioned uh, zoning changes. There's going to be a lot of zoning changes. And wouldn't you know it, right on cue, California is attempting to push something through the legislature that would essentially eliminate single family zoning, right? right? Which would, yes. So if you think if you think that through for a second, that means you can do a whole bunch of mixed use stuff in single family residential areas, areas that were once reserved for just, you know, single family homes. All of a sudden, theoretically, you can build mixed use or which I which is what I think they're going for uh, homeless, you know, homeless and can't like homeless housing, low income housing, stuff like that. But um, what could possibly go wrong? With uh, <laughs> with building more low income housing and homeless housing right smack in the middle of single family residential neighborhoods, uh, you think that's how? How do you think that would shake out, Chris? Uh, how do I think that would shake out? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> uh, come to New York and I'll show you exactly how that shakes out. You just take a visit and you'll okay. see a little thing or two about what happened with that. It'll basically become just, you know, it, I, I got to be careful how I say this, but it'll become another welfare state, you know, where you're, you're taking away the reason why people want to live in a certain area. And now all of a sudden you're, you're basically forcing this into it. Now I'm not saying there isn't a need for low income housing, but there's a place for that. You can't take, you know, regular neighborhoods that are single family homes and all of a sudden just say, Hey, we're going to put in multifamilies all around you. It's going to destroy the value of the properties around there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. This is, I this know. is how I would qualify that. That's, that's yes. to Matt's comment yes. right yes. there. Dumpster fire yes. 2020. Well, believe me, California is making its best efforts to turn California even more of a dumpster fire than it already is so it's a, they're they're valiant they're valiant up there they're fighting the good fight All i right. was there last year i couldn't believe what i saw just walking down the streets and i've been oh, there many insane. times and i'm just like what, what happened here and that's um, all i'm gonna say lots of lots of lots of ideas but you know what it just is a lot of it, it i think it happened in anybody's state anybody's financial you know history or future it's just that one that first step right not a big deal then we take another one not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Then you look back at your path and you're like, holy shit, like look at all the bad decisions we made. And it's just one little thing at a time. You know, I think that's what happens to a lot of us on our business, marriages, friendships, you know, financial stuff. It's just that one little step. So Chris, how can people stop taking that little, one little step and let's make some wealth. Let's talk some money. Let's put some money in each other's pockets without it being government funded. Sure. It's simple. I mean, really the, the, the route to success and the route to building wealth really starts with taking back the money that you're giving away to everybody else. I mean, a lot of people, when they think about making and building wealth, they go back to what they've been taught their whole life. And that is going out and working harder, working longer, you know, doing the hustle to make more money. Now that's a piece of it. I'm not saying there's not, I'm not taking anything away from the hustle, but wouldn't it just be smarter instead of focusing all your time and energy on working harder to make more money, on how about just taking back the money that you give away to everybody else every month? I mean, think of like the average person. If they went through and created just a budget, novel idea, it's not hard. Income on one side, all your expenses and your debts on the other side. And you looked at where your money went. What you will find is most people, 90% of every penny they make goes out the door to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that's credit cards, debts, car payments, all these things. But if we wanted to build wealth, wouldn't it make more sense to literally go there and say, how do I take back the money that I'm giving away to everybody else? And mm -hmm. you know, when I tell people that they're like, that's impossible. No, actually it's, it's not, it's not impossible. It's actually very simple to you. You just got to change one thing. You got to change one thing in what you do. And that's the one thing that's the hardest thing to do. So, I don't know if you want me to just roll right into it, but I mean, yeah. the, the other thing too is what I'm saying is not something that I pioneered. It's something that I learned by watching what wealthy people do. You asked about that earlier. You know, are wealthy people going to get richer and wealthier during this economic time, this economic crash that we're about to see? The answer is 100%. They always do. The wealthy get wealthier during hard times because they're prepared and they know exactly what to do because they're in control of their money. So back to that one thing you got to change. That's what you got to change. You got to change where your money goes first and you got to put yourself in control of it. You see, we've been taught our whole lives to give up control of our good dollars today. We've been taught to put our money in other people's control. And then what do they do? Well, they go make money. And who am I talking about? Well, how about financial institutions. How about banks? We put our money in both of these two institutions, not even thinking about it. And what do they do? They go out and make more money. Heck, some of them actually charge us to give a, give them our money, which is bizarre because if you think about your money today, your dollars are worth the most right now because tomorrow your dollars are worth less. God forbid the government keeps this printing you know, press going like they are. Your dollars will become worth almost nothing. They're already fiat dollars, not even worth anything except for we say that they're worth something or the government says it is. So if your dollars are worth the most today, why are you putting all your money in retirement plans when you're buried in debt? Why are you putting all your money in the stock market when you're buried in debt? Why don't we just take that and change where it goes and pay off debt? And then, you know, a lot of people just stop there like, all right, I paid my debt off. Now what? No, pay your debt off slowly, pay your credit cards down and then take whatever money you were giving the credit card company and then deposit that back in your accounts. So that's the simplest philosophy. And if you just focused on doing that, you would slowly start to take back the money you're giving away to everybody else. But then the problem is people don't know how to keep their money moving. They don't know how to keep their money in their control. And that's because they put their money right back in the same place it came from the first time. And that's the banks. What are the banks paying today? 1%? less than 1%, how about zero? 
Heck, pretty soon, if the government goes into this negative interest rate territory, it will cost us money to keep our money at banks. Yep. How does that sound? You deposit yep. your money at the bank and the bank charges you for having it there. Yeah, it's insane. It, it is insane. insane. And it's so easy to change the dynamic of this entire thing, which I'm sure we're going to kind of flush that out. But like, that's what we've been taught to do. That's all we've been taught to do. So nobody is wrong for doing what they're doing. It's simply you've been taught and lied to your whole life about how money really works. That's really every time I hear you, you know, talk every time I do an interview with you, I just my blood starts to boil because it's so infuriating because they, they're like, we want to help everybody, both sides, the Dems and the Republicans. Everyone, wanna, everyone wants to help everybody. But yet nobody ever teaches the secret because guess what? There's no money in it. That, that's exactly why. I mean, what I do and, and what I teach, you know, America, there is no money in it. And that's the hardest thing. You know, like when I set off on this thing, I had to find a way to monetize it, but there's no monetization in the first phase. And if there is, it's very small. So you make money three layers deep, but it takes a lot of time to make money with that. So the average person that would teach what I teach won't because they can't make any money doing it, or they have to take a 60 to 90% cut in what they make just to do what we do. And that's the that's the the fact of the matter is follow the dollar. Yeah. So stu stupid question here. Do you do you think I, I just wonder about this a lot? Like I don't uh, maybe it's changed because I've been out of school for 134 years, but I mean I I don't remember any kind of economics really taught like real world economics. How to balance a checkbook? Like I still don't balance a checkbook the right way. Like if you saw what I did, you'd be like, how do you keep track of that? Um, do you think that that's an institutionalized thing where they keep that out of school on purpose, or do you think that like why why would it be that we sh we're not teaching 16 and 17 year olds how to manage money. Is there a purpose behind that? Of course there is. You can't teach people this stuff when they're in school and then actually allow them to go out and think for themselves and create. No, you need them to conform. You know, let me take that. That question is such a valid question. Of course, it's by design that they don't teach this. They teach us how to be employees. Think about everything from grade school to middle school to high school to college. What are they teaching you to do? An employee. They're teaching you how to be an employee and how to be a good steward of that employer. That's what they're teaching you to do. I, I get a lot of people that hate on me because I say that, but you know what? It's the damn truth. Look at it. Look how it works. And it's the same reason why, and I'm going to give you some statistics. If you went around, you interviewed 20 or you interviewed 125 year olds and you asked them this one simple question. You said, are you going to be financially successful by the time you're 65? What would their answer be? They wouldn't even think it would be like, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. No question. And you, and you know what? All things considered, they're absolutely right. They will be successful because that's what they think they're going to be. But then as life goes on, as they get kicked around, they get beat up, they get kicked to the ground and they don't want to get back up. What happens? Well, they start to conform. They start to conform with what everything else that they, you know, everybody around them and everything else is doing. And they do, they, they do exactly that. So when you conform, you just follow the leader, which means that brings you to the end result, which is age 65, the statistics, this is social security administration. The statistics are this only five out of those 125 year olds will be financially successful. The rest, the other 95 will not be financially secure at the age of 65. Like what happened there? Like, was it school? Was it a problem? It was, they conformed. Only the five were the ones that went out and created. Because if you stop creating, what are you living for? And I bet you, if you took that one layer deeper and you started to ask people, why do you go to work? Like, let's just say you went up just a stranger on the street that's going to work. And you said, why do you go to work? I bet you most of them would say, I don't know. Or most of them would say, because I have to. Man, you don't Absolutely. have to do anything you don't want to do. You choose to do yeah. that. You choose to want to ha or to have to go to work. You know what? The people that are successful, they don't go to work because they have to. They go to work because they choose to because they're creating something and they're working toward their perfect day. You see, they have an end goal. They know what their perfect day looks like and they know what it's going to take to get there. People that conform, they have no, they're just like wandering around. It's like a bunch of zombies wander, wandering around, not having purpose in why they do what they do. Creation is the most powerful thing. And the problem with conforming is you stop thinking, you stop dreaming, you stop realizing that you can do anything you want because you just have accepted that you just have to conform with the normal. Look at politics. You, you, you want to take what I'm just saying and like put it into perspective. Look at what the fuck is going on right now with politics. If that's not conforming, then I shit. I don't know what I'm doing. Sorry about yeah. the language. So, no, well, we don't really give a fuck. It's okay. Well, <laughs> can, I, can I piggyback on that? I don't want to take over the show, but I'm, he's got me thinking about some things, right? 
and, and this might take it down a different road because I feel like we could do five shows off this next question. Oh, yeah. And there's and there's no really no no real answer, right? But I so we're, I'm going through this right now. So we go back to the kids in school thing. What I, I would argue that being an employee is not a bad thing. No, not like, at all. We need we uh, entrepreneurs need employees. That's how big businesses are built, right? So like I, I don't want it to come off like we're talking about. If you're an employee, you're a drone. Like there's people that do not like. I feel like it's right right brain left brain thing. If you're a creative and you have the that crazy cowboy mentality you can be an entrepreneur some people are just comfortable going to work and saving the money that way right where i want to get to is this i have a 15 year old and a 12 year old and i know i know as an entrepreneur and who's actually served in the real world right like not my as my wife calls not my fantasy land where i'm having lunches all the time with people but <laughs> it, i've actually worked for verizon as a manager and i now know that she's going into sophomore juniors of high school having no idea how to handle money because I watch it on a regular basis. Hmm. Right. And, and then the argument comes up, do I have to go to college? And my wife is a doctor. So clearly she went to college. I am not a doctor and I did not go to college. So I always say to them, and well, I don't really say it, but I say, who, whose life, life would you rather have daddies or mommies? And I know what the <laughs> answer is because I'm the one they think that doesn't do anything. Right. So it's always like, well, I want to be daddies drinking beer and going to lunch. Like it's cool. <laughs> but my, I guess to wrap this around again, my question is, What's what's the right move, dude? I mean, like, and I'm, maybe I'm asking for parenting advice, and I don't know if you can give it, right? Like, what's the move there? I, how do you make sure that these kids, is there something, a tool in place that I could put in front of my 15-year-old to help her understand this a little bit better? Because she's not going to get it in school and make it this, understand what an entrepreneur versus an employee is and what makes you, like, any advice on that? I know that was a yeah, wide open No, question, that's right? okay. It's a very good one. And first and foremost, there is a lot of merit in, in people working for other people. That has to happen. And there's a lot of people that are very happy with this. I think I should have reframed that and said, it's not so much about being self-employed or, or being an employee. It's about actually loving what you do and going to work and creating something. I don't care if that's creating something for your employer or that. So back to your kids. What do I think? You know, I, I have a three-month-old and I think about this all the time. How do I prepare her for this crazy world we live in? And I think I think it's that. I think it's planting the seed that in her life, right? You know, when kids are young, they can dream. They can, they think about things. They're always thinking of new ideas and nothing's impossible, right? They're in their minds. Not, there is no barriers until they get older when they're told they can't do something. So I think the biggest thing is, is to keep them dreaming, keep them believing that the things that they dream about should be written down on paper, should be, you know, illustrated. If they can't draw, tell them to cut pictures out and stare at them every day and never stop talking about what they want. The second thing is, is then tell them how to take those ideas and those dreams and create something. You know, I, I, I hate the fact that we don't see lemonade stands out there anymore. Now I know there's reasons, but like, think about like what that does for a child. You show a child how to go out and create a little stand in their front yard, selling lemonade or cookies or whatever. You literally just showed them the path of creation and the path of being self-employed, whether or not they work for somebody else, they created that. And think of the joy that they get out of selling one cup of their mm -hmm. created lemonade they did or their created cookie. So I think the biggest thing you can do for children is never ever tell them they shouldn't create or never block them from their dreams in creating what they are. And also never tell them they can't do something. Like I grew up with nothing. And you know what my mom never, ever, ever did once is tell me I couldn't do something. Even if in her mind, she was like, oh, that's a crazy idea. Holy shit. You're, you're going to go dig a pond in the backyard. But you know what I did? I, and I couldn't dig a pond. I went out in the backyard for weeks and I dug holes thinking I was going to have this giant pond stocked with fish that I would go out there and fish. And you know what ended up happening? I want to get, I want you to really take that. Now, as a little kid, I was like five or six. What do you think ended up happening from that? I yeah. dug a pond and the pond was about, you know, I don't know. It wasn't a pond, but when I dug that pond and I, I filled it up with the hose, I went down the street, I caught a fish, a sunfish, and I put that sunfish in there. And I sat out there for hours with a fishing pole thinking that I was going to catch this sunfish. I was dreaming folks. That's all I was doing. It's so stupid. She, my mom's laughing at me, but you know what? She didn't tell me, Chris, that you're never going to catch that fish. Like that pond's going to dry up in a week, but I still created it. And I realized that my dream became a reality. Everything in my life has been that. So mm. I want my kids to realize that there is no restrictions, that if you think of something and you can dream it, it actually can be real because it really is a law and, and there's nothing stopping that. So teach mm. them that. And then, yeah. you know, with money, teach them to be in the biggest thing with money is teach them to be in control of their money. 
teach them never to give up control and show them very simple ways to do budgeting and how to be in control of their money and how to be a good steward of moving their money. The biggest thing I'm going to teach my daughter is when she gets money, honey, don't put that money in the piggy bank and let it sit there because that's like putting your money in a stagnant pond. And I'm going to walk her out and I'm going to show her a stagnant pond and I'm going to have her smell it. And I'm going to say, you want to eat fish out of that? <laughs> exactly. You wouldn't want to eat those fish, but then I'm going to show her a raging stream and I'm going to say, you want to eat fish out of that? That's beautiful. Isn't it? The sound, the, just the smell it's, it's moving. It's alive. Your money needs to move. So if you put your money in your piggy bank and you don't do anything, so I'm probably going to take the piggy bank and I'm going to break it. And I'm going to say, that's not what money does. And then I'm going to have her pick that money up. And I'm going to say, what are we going to do with that money to make more of that money? And now maybe it's a lemonade stand. Maybe it's make cookies. Maybe we buy an ad on Facebook to promote something she's created that, cause I didn't stop her from dreaming. I'm going down a tangent, but you see what I'm saying? Don't let them believe that parking their money and letting it sit is what money does. And don't let them think money's evil have them talk about money when they're talking to their friends, have them talk about money and what it does and the beauty that it can do. Cause it's just a tool and then drill a hole in a two by four and say, listen, how did that hole get there? And then have her answer it. And just, she'll say the drill bit and everything else. And just say, no, you needed the holes and the drill, bit was just the tool that put it through it. And that's a bad example, but you see what I'm saying? Just <laughs> teach them how to use tools, money, is no different than that drill bit. Money is no different than the shovel I used to dig that hole in the back that to me was the pond that I was going to catch fish from. Mm -hmm. That's it. Well, it comes down to dreaming. I uh, I keep <clears> a <throat> book that I have written a lot of goals in. And I got really, really you know, concise with it. And I found it. I, I reviewed it. And then in this little red book, you know, actually has EXP written on it, but I write uh, a phrase uh, down uh, four times, three times a day, morning, afternoon, and, and dinner. Uh, and it's the same phrase over and over and over again. It has to pertain to money. And I was afraid of thinking about something this big, but my goal is to literally fill this entire book up every single page with exactly what I'm putting intentionally out there. Cause it's dreaming. It's something I'm putting into the universe. And once I get it and it's tangible, then I'm going to hire you as my personal financial, uh, advisor. And we're going to go 10 X this bitch, but easy. <clears throat> But it's, but it's something that like a lot of people are, I think a lot of people are scared of thinking big, right? I know I was for a long period of time. I found something, you know, I want you guys to all go research this, please. Uh, I found, a, 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 I don't know, I guess a, a practice, right? It's called the Sedona method. So go research the Sedona method. And it's asking yourself three questions and it will release negative energy off of you. So if you're listening to this and you're like, there's no way I'm going to be able to make money like Chris. There's no money there. I don't deserve it or whatever else. The Sedona method, you, you, you do this, you, you resonate with whatever your problem is. So let's say your money is an issue, right? So think about your money and the problems you're having with it. Then you ask yourself, here he goes, you know, could I release it? Yes or no, binary answer. Then it's, would I release it? You know, asking yourself permission. And then you ask yourself the simple question, when? Yes, no answers on, on either of them. They'll release the energy out. And that's the only way I've ever been able to move past that fear of accomplishing things in my life. I'll just release the negative thoughts around it because so many people keep a negative. I have negative thoughts about around money. And so like that's why I'm preaching right now is because it's it's something that's so relevant in my life. But I, I know we got to love topic. that. And let me go one step further. Let me just talk to you. Like I, I held this thing up as a joke, right? The money problem. And you know, that remember that comedian, here's your sign, you know, stupid people. Well, you know, this is kind of the same thing. <laughs> I want you to think of the logic behind what I'm going to tell you. And I want you to visualize yourself doing this, because I'll tell you what, the scariest thing about what I'm about to say is there's going to be too many people that are like, yeah, I do that. How many people do you know that our every day they wake up, they know they got a bunch of credit card debt. At the end of the month, they, they hate paying those credit cards. They get all this credit card debt over here and all these debts, right? But then every single day when they go to work, they're putting money into their 401k or they're setting up these, these you know, automatic you know, deposits into their savings account. Their savings account is always an emergency fund. And they just keep doing this, right? So they're, they're saving for the retirement. And then over here, they've got their emergency fund. Yet over here, they've got literally the perpetual hole, which is their debts. And they think nothing of that. You see, I look at that and instantly I know how to solve that problem. I say, okay, this is very simple. I just did it this morning with a, oh, they, they actually did really well. They're in the medical industry. They made a lot of money and they were this. And when I asked them, why are you doing this? They didn't know. I said, wait a second, hold on. That 401k you're putting money into. First off, you're maxing out your contributions because you're trying to get to this destination that you don't even know what it looks like. You don't even know what retirement is. If I ask you, what is your retirement? I don't know. 
It's not riding off in the sale, but they don't know. They're just putting money in because that's what they were told to do. They're conforming. I told them, I said, listen, you got all this debt over here and that's keeping you up at night. So that's the problem we need to solve. Let's go to your 401k. Let's back down the amount you're putting into your 401k. Let's ask your 401k provider, do they allow loans? The answer was yes. Great. So we're going to take a loan from your 401k. First answer was, yeah, but then I got to pay it back. Hang on one second. We're going to take a loan from your 401k, which you now do have to pay back every pay period, and you have to pay it back with interest. We're going to take that loan and we're going to pay off some of these credit card debts. Now, when we pay these credit cards debts off, you no longer need to mail checks to those credit cards. So we're going to take dollar for dollar exactly what you were given to the credit cards, what you're donating, and we're going to take that money and we're going to repay that money back to your 401k. In doing that, you literally just became the bank and now you're paying yourself back with interest because the interest on the 401k goes back into your 401k. You didn't change anything. You just took money that was sitting there out of your control for some phantom day in the future and you just took care of your today problem. But now let's, let's get even stupider with this. I meet people every single day doing calls that have 10, 15, 30, 100,000 sitting in their savings account, in their savings account losing 3.2% every single year to inflation. And I asked them, what is this money for? An emergency. And then I say to them, okay, let's talk about your debts. And they've got all these debts, car payments, they got student loans, they've got credit cards. And I say, isn't that an emergency? Well, no, I mean, like if something happens and I need to put a roof on, okay. We take the money from your savings account, which is losing. We pay off all these debts. We take the money you were paying the debts and we then redirect it automatically bill pay, okay? Into your savings account. It shouldn't go there, but that's what we tell them to do. You literally just moved money and you literally just took back the wealth that you were giving away. So now all of a sudden, these people today alone had an extra $2,400 every single month going into their savings that they were giving away. And it took changing one thing. And that was just getting them to understand that they need to change that one, move that money. I mean, how many people do you know that do this? No it's one. sick. Hmm. Yeah, it's it sick. like it just doesn't make any sense. If you're paying 20% in your credit cards, which would be probably low for most people. And all you did is you took back that money by taking money from this side and paying it off and moving it back over here. You just effectively made a 20% return on your money. <laughs> like it's stupid. Like think about that. Your, your 401k <laughs> is your 401k making 20%. Well then do what I just said and you'll make 20% and you have zero risk. You're mm. almost guaranteed to make 20% because it's money you were giving away. All you yes, did is it took it back. That's really That's interesting. Crazy. I've heard you talk about that several times. And again, I, I can't understand why this isn't, why people don't understand this. Well, I have a hard it, time. It's because mm -hmm. it, our brains hurt after hearing this because again, it's being conditioned consistently by every mm -hmm. single ad, every single time I walk into the mm -hmm. branch. Hi, welcome. You know, we're FDIC insured. If anything happens to your money, it's guaranteed, but it, it, it's already guaranteed. It's already in this other account. I mean, you can't, no, no bank robber can go to your 401k and snatch your 401k with a gun and a mask. And given we all wear masks, we're all bank robbers now. Um, but you know, it, it's just interesting because I always it didn't make a lot of sense to me the first couple of times I heard it, and that's my own fault. But that makes total sense. So let's say, like me, I don't have a 401k. I'm a, I've been a real estate agent for 21 years, my entire since I came out of college. I've been a real estate agent, and before that, I was a douchebag college kid. So since I don't have a shut up, Matt. <laughs> so, it's, but the great part about being me on this show sometimes is I don't even have to say anything. You insult yourself. It's it makes my job much easier here. I mean, it's 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 really what I come here to do. But sometimes you make it a little bit easier. Okay, now shut up. <laughs> so I don't have a four hundred one k. Where do I pull this from? How do I do this then? Where does your money go? I mean, you make money, and that money has to go somewhere. Where does your money go that doesn't pay bills? Bank. Goes okay. under his mattress. Well, yeah, did, do, you, do you have like a, a strategy for that? Like, do you have like a systematic savings plan with your bank where you put X amount in or X amount of every, you know, sale that you get paid a commission goes into, you know, this bank? I love how you do the derogatory little hit on that. This bank. Oh, don't even get me warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> do you, so do you have like a plan with the thieves set up to like give them a certain <laughs> set amount every Are month? Are you complicit? <laughs> yeah. Are you complicit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, they give thanks. you suckers and the suckers always have a wrapper on them that says dum dum so welcome 
<laughs> oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> true or true, right? It's so true. Every bank in the United States and even other countries have dumb, dumb suckers. And I can't yet figure out whether they own dumb, dumbs or whether they're just trying to send us a signal. <laughs> oh, they're sending us a, a, a subtle signal. Hey, so, dumb, so you're, dumb, so you're oh the God. dumb, dumb that's putting all your money in the bank and, and it's okay because right. you're not doing anything wrong. It's just what you've been taught. But think right. about what you're doing there. You're, you're giving the bank your money. And what, mm -hmm. is your, what do you think is happening then? Is your bank taking your dollars that you're depositing there, putting them back in your little box in the back with your name on it so that when you come back, they're like, oh, let me go grab your box and I'll give you your money back. No, no. the bank is taking 10 cents of every dollar, setting that aside in reserves and then taking the other 90 cents and then loaning it out while you're sitting there right behind you. There's someone sitting in one of those glass cubicles. The bank's mm -hmm. lending that money out. And in doing this process of moving your money in and out, they're making 400 to 1300% on your money. That's it. Well, people, Fargo, that Fargo. usually gets people pretty pissed off, but you know what? It's okay. Like, don't get mad. Don't get mad at all because they just learned how to do this and you can learn how to do that too. And all you need to do is stop parking your money and just letting it sit like a stagnant pond and move that shit, move mm -hmm. that money. Now you talked about a really interesting vehicle um, on how, how you could do that. You want to explain that hot, hot for a yeah, hot second? So, I mean, the biggest thing I do, and there's no secret behind this is instead of using banks, I use mutually owned insurance companies. Why? Well, that's because that's what the Rockefellers did. The Rothschilds, that's what all the wealthy people throughout time from Oprah to Warren Buffett, they all do the same damn thing. So if I'm, if I'm not that smart, why wouldn't I just mimic what the wealthy do? Maybe they know something more than I do. So what do I do? Well, instead of using banks that don't pay me anything or pay me less than what I want to earn. I put my money through mutually owned insurance companies, big ones, like 168 year old ones. And in doing this through this specially designed and engineered whole life policy, that's right. I said it whole life policy instantly. Every single person listening is like, Oh, life insurance. Here we go. He's trying to sell life insurance. Great. <laughs> get off the podcast. You are, you're excluded. You go, you're in timeout. Like if that's how you think this works, then you are completely wrong because you fall into the main thing. And here's your card. There's your card. There's your problem. <laughs> so we're not talking about regular life insurance, but that's the vehicle that the wealthy have used to put money into mutual owned insurance companies. It's the only way, but they don't use it as life insurance. They use it as a banking system. So by putting your money over there, a couple of things happen. First off, you earn a guaranteed 4%. Now, I just want to be clear about this. This is not every whole life policy out there, and this is not every insurance company out there. This is very specialized. So don't go to your state farm agent and say, hey, I heard of this <laughs> podcast. I want to open one of those banking whole life things. He'll <laughs> say, oh yeah, I can do that. And you will have an absolute piece of shit whole life policy, just like Dave Ramsey says. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> these are different. I just want to be clear about that. <laughs> when I deposit money into this specially designed and engineered whole life, this privatized banking policy, I'm making a guaranteed 4%. The insurance company literally gives me a stamped guarantee of 4%. Now, if you're not making 4% on your bank account, then maybe you should listen. But not only that, these are mutually owned companies, not publicly traded on the Wall Street or the stock market exchanges. They're mutuals. So what do they do every year? Well, they share in their, their profits, their surplus with us, the policyholders. So how much am I making on my money at the insurance company I'm talking about? 6.2%. So is your bank paying you 6.2? Are you comfortable making 6.2 where you're at? Is it guaranteed? I don't know, but I am. But here's the beauty. You see, I don't put my money there and leave it like we've been taught you know, on everything else. I don't just park it in this insurance policy and just say, okay, great. You just hang on to that. Hell no. I put it there and I immediately within 30 days, take that money out. And then what do I do with it? I move it. I loan it out at 12%. I buy real estate with it. I pay off debt with it. I pay for my wife's car. And instead of paying GM Financial or, or Porsche, I take that monthly payment and I pay it back to my policy. And when I make rent on my policies or on my real estate deals, what do I do? I take and charge my real estate company 6% interest and my real estate company pays back my bank over here. You see, all I'm doing is I'm becoming the bank. And in becoming the bank, that means that there's three rules. Number one, I'm always going to pay myself back with interest. Number two, I'm always going to pay myself first. Okay. Change where the money goes first. And number three, I'm going to recycle and recapture all of the money that I'm giving away. So all that means is if I pay off a credit card, I'm going to recapture the money that I was giving that credit card and put it back in my banking policy. The whole time this whole thing happened, when I put money in and I took money out, 
I never ever stopped earning 6.2% or 4% plus the dividend. If you look at other years, 4% plus dividend on my money ever, as long as I live for as long as I live that money, even if I took it all out, will continually make 4% plus dividends. It's called and, uninterrupted compound interest. Like, and, and to, to further that, I think, so I have a, a couple of friends that actually sell this and I want to, I want to mm -hmm. say one thing about it and I ask you a question, but I, uh, the other thing is like, I want to explain to you from a perspective of, of a guy on this side who's not in finances, why that's scary. So one is when you're borrowing that money, if I'm not mistaken, that doesn't come out of your account. You still make the, you still make that four and 6.2% on your balance, even yep. though your money's out. Right. So mm -hmm. that compound interest on the money that it, it, the numbers, it's not just a simple 6.2%. It's that minus the 27% you're not paying back to capital one minus like all these things together. Right. But I mm -hmm. think I've, I've sat through this multiple on multiple occasions from people that I trust. And like you said, there's only a couple of companies in the, in the country that do it. You got to really dig in and find it. Right. I think it's too good to be true. That's bingo. And, I love it. Right. That's not what I think. I just, I'm pretty, I'm pretty in tune with some of this stuff. And I listen to the guys that make the money, right? Like the people that are around me that I look at and go, yeah, I want to have that dude's income. I'm listening. And that's what you said, like the Rockefellers, right? This is stuff. These are vehicles they've used. And then I listen to it and I go, I could never explain that to my wife. And I know she would think that's a scam. How, how, how do you talk to that? Yeah, it's very easy. And that is the number one thing. Every single person that sees this, watches our video, almost all of them say, this is too good to be true. Mm -hmm. And if it's too good to be true, then why has it been around for hundreds of years? Why is it that this has never changed? Why is it that this is the vehicle that's always been used? But okay, so maybe it does sound too good to be true that you can put money there, take that money back out and never stop earning interest. Maybe you just need to understand the two additional reasons why that's so easy to understand. First off, you put your money in this insurance company, okay? You deposit your money there. And the insurance company allows you to take all, you know, some or all of that money out and you don't, you don't stop earning interest. How does that work? It doesn't even make sense. It's because you're not taking your own money. The insurance company from their general accounts as a profit motive, lend you money from their general account. And then they take the money that's still in your account and use it as collateral. But what interest rate do they charge you on the money that they're lending you? Well, right now it's 5%. So if you're making 6.2 and you're earning five, aren't you ahead by a per 1.2%? Well, you are. But then, you know, then now all of a sudden we've entered into this unknown area that scares people. It's called loans. If you take a loan from any anywhere, what what ha what things come to your mind? What do you have to do when you take a loan? Pay interest. Okay. What pay, else? Pay, pay fees. Mm. If you wait, what well, okay, you pay, fee, it back. Interest, pay it back. That's your, what I was yeah, for. you're committing. You're committing to a you know an right. increase in your uh, monthly expenses. Basically, I that, thought that's what scares uh, scares people. Well, that would scare me too. Now, so I'm borrowing. So I deposit my money there, and to get my money, I got to borrow it and take loans, and and mm. I don't want I don't want more debt. Great. Well, what if I told you that the insurance company will never ever ask you for those loans back? Now, does that make you even kind of be like, this is altogether way too good to be yep. true? Right. Yep. Okay. So it, it's so easy. It's not. So the reason they don't care if you ever pay those loans back is because the second thing that we missed is that insurance company and that contract promised to pay a death benefit someday when you graduate. And I don't mean graduate from college. I mean the big graduation. The day you die, <laughs> they've promised to pay your beneficiaries, your whoever you list, a tax-free death benefit. So all the insurance company is doing is they're letting you use their money from their general account. And folks, they have plenty of it. You can't use it all, I promise you. They loan you that money from the general account. That money is secure because it's collateralized by your account balance, which is ne never stopped earning uninterrupted compound interest. But now that you've got this loan, the insurance company literally does a little mathematical thing on the screen and says, okay, we got a $100,000 loan from their policy. We're gonna reduce the death benefit by 100 grand. All you're doing is taking a loan from your death benefit. You're leveraging your death benefit while you're living. The insurance company could care less if you ever pay it back. Matter of fact, they'll never even ask you for it because that 5% they're charging you, that's a profit center for them. So mm -hmm. that 5%, we can control that too by that recapture. Remember I said, if we use that money to pay, let's say we pay off our car loan and whatever the money is we were paying our car loan, let's say it's 500 bucks a month. What if we took the 500 a month and we just took it back over here and we repaid the loan to the insurance company? What's happening? Well, number one, the same exact dollars you were giving away before are now going back into your account. As you pay the loan down, your balance and use of your money 
comes back and you pay the insurance company less and less and less interest because you're paying your loan back. Do you want to be the bank or do you want to be slaves to all the other banks out there? It's, it's that simple. So when people say to me, this sounds too good to be true, I say, I understand. When I first heard it, I said the same thing. And here's why it's not too good to be true, X, Y, and Z. It's so easy to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and why this has been used for hundreds of years and it's never, ever failed. Yeah. And, and there's security in there. Like I, th I think for someone like me that looks at things that the government is doing and, um, and, and considers that there's a lot of insecurity there because the government seemingly changes the rules from day to day on what's, what's allowed and what's not. That was one of the things when I first heard about this too, my, my first reaction was great. Let's say it's not too good to be true, but it seems like it's an innovative way to use something. What if they just wipe out the ability to use it? And uh, and the retort to that is just that they're they're not going to shoot themselves in the foot because they want to use it too. So they're not going to change the rules for the rest of us because they want to be able to use it, right? You you nailed it. So why will the rules never change on this? Why when you know the tax law, the, the IRS was created in 1913, why did this kind of just go right by and remain tax free? I forgot right. to tell everybody that every penny you make on that that policy inside of it is all tax free. I forgot to mention that. So why is that that way? Would you ever think that this is where all the wealthy people keep their money? And don't the wealthy people, aren't they the ones that kind of are in, I hate to say in politics, but you know, the ones writing the laws, the ones controlling yeah. it, the ones lobbying, paying money to these. Listen, folks, it's all connected. You can hate on it as much as you want, but this will never change because this is where all their money's at. From McCain to Biden, I don't know about Trump, but probably I'm not, I don't care what political stance you take. They're using this. I mm -hmm. guarantee it. Well, well, if Trump's using that, that automatically means it's the most terrible thing that's ever invented. Correct. It's going to burn the world down. And how Biden. dare you suggest it, Chris? How dare you? <laughs> Dumbass. Yeah. Whether I like Biden or not, and you, I'm a self-employed individual, so you can figure out whether I like him or not. He uses it. So all of you Trump haters, who cares if Trump uses it? Even if he did, you'd hate it anyway. So Biden uses it. <laughs> hey, there we go. It's a win then. Chris, and, and I, I got a quick question for you on this one. Uh, Jake Wolf is, is, is watching us and he is regarding the folks that own businesses. I'm um, curious uh, to hear of Chris's opinion about utilizing LLCs in a way to shelter from the tax uh, depreciate uh, depreciating assets and grow wealth. Absolutely. Like if you're not using entities to basically grow your wealth and control how much you pay the government in taxes, then I think you really need to read a couple of books and get a good CPA that will tell you you have to do that because the LLC provides protection, but the LLC is also the way that you're going to control what you pay in taxes. W-2 employees like my clients this morning, they're, you know, they're in the medical field. They can't control their taxes. They get a check and their taxes get hit hard. The more they make, the more they pay in taxes. If you're running a business through your LLC or your entity, you control all of that. You can go out and buy more paper, more toilet paper. And by the way, toilet paper is a great investment right now. So I hear uh, <laughs> toilet paper. You can go out and buy more real estate. Let's just say, you know, you're, you're going to have a big tax hit because you made a bunch of money. Great. You know what you do? Buy a ton of real estate and put a ton of money into that real estate and then rent it. And guess what you just did is created a massive tax deduction and you get to depreciate that whole son of a pup. And it, there's just so many ways that you can control your destiny when it comes to taxes by using LLCs or S corps, C corps, entities, trusts. I mean, there's a lot of different ways. Dude, that's, it's just, I mean, there's, we, we're coming up on the end of this thing, but I mean, obviously again, we did not even scratch the surface. Um, any other final questions before we wrap up? Because I know, I know we're yeah, having, sure. I'm hearing little pops all over the country and the most people's brains exploding. <laughs> it's like the, the, it's like the end of the first Kingsman movie. Just boom. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I've witnessed firsthand. I've witnessed like I'm talking to, you know, the husband understands it or the wife understands it because they watched my video, but the other party doesn't. And then I get on a call with them and I'm, I'm drawing a circle and I show it to him with a circle. And all of a sudden I watch it on zoom. There's like a pop, like you just said, and all of a sudden they get it. And they're just like, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't understand that. Because it is that simple, folks. If it's complicated, it's simply because you just haven't quite made that snap yet to understand what's going on here because you're not doing anything different. You're not working harder, not working longer. You're not taking on any risk and you're not giving up any control. You're changing one thing and that's where your money goes first. Everything else remains exactly the same as what you're doing today. So I mean, this is a question that I just popped in my brain. So we change where the money goes, right? Mm -hmm. What about my, my bank card? I mean, oh, we don't need that anymore, but what about my- oh, sure you do. Sure you do. So you, you still keep a little bit of cash in a bank or you, how, do you, how do you run that? 
if I get, if there's 10 grand in my bank account, I get really pissed off at myself, but you know, it's a game, you know, it's like, Oh, how did that happen? And then you just get it. You find a way to get it back into the banking policies. It you're literally like, it's not about where the money's at. It's about how you move the money. That's all it is. Draw a circle and just figure out how to get money from the left side where it's making, you know, 4% plus dividend to the right side. And then from the right side, whatever you're given over up over there to everybody else, and then get that back over to the left side. Literally, if you play that little game with a circle, you will understand what's happening. We're just moving money the same way the bank does it with your deposits. The bank takes your deposit and very quickly figures out ooh, who needs a loan. Who, do, who can I loan this money to and charge more? That's all you're trying to do. You see, what I what we do here and how I just explained this allows every single one of you to make not just money one time, you can make money twice. Let me go one final thing. I know we're at the end, but imagine like a, a stock, you know, someone that's big into stocks or Forex, they love investing in the stock market. And they're like, I make more money doing this. And I say, okay, great. How about making money twice or a real estate investor? Like, cause sometimes they think that there's nothing better to make money. I say, great, keep doing what you're doing. I love it. You're making a ton of money. But what if I could show you how to make money twice doing the same thing you're doing right now? And all that is, is change that one thing. Put the money over here, take the money back out, put it in your real estate. Put the money over here, take the money back out, buy Apple, Tesla, whatever stocks you're buying. You just, if you're making money on the stock market, now all of a sudden you're making money twice because your interest never stops. But the one thing about the interest on the left side is uninterrupted compound interest by Albert Einstein's words is the eighth wonder of the world. The most powerful thing in the financial universe and those who understand it, earn it. Those who don't pay it. I'll leave it with that. Damn. Damn. Love it. Yeah, damn is Mike right. Drop. That's a pretty good one. So <laughs> let me ask one more thing. We take it out on this note if you want. I mean, yeah, obviously it. it's not my show, but um, I'm just curious. I, I have had a lot of conversations with uh, some friends, some extremely wealthy and some not. Um, but what's what's happened over the last six months has really changed people's perspective and trajectory and really their plans. Um, I'm curious, Chris, as to if there's any and whether you relate it to to what we talk about for money or if it's something that you only you care about. Has has your has one thing changed for you? Have you shifted your goals because of what's oh. going on in the last couple of months? Is there something new that you want? Maybe a new toy because you figured I, I'm dragging this out because I put you on the spot. Uh, is there a new toy that you figured it, it's a terrible purchase, but I'm buying it anyway because we're not going to live forever? Anything like that that's that's happened in the last couple of months? Yeah, a lot's happened, but it's not a toy. I mean, I've, I've if I wanted a toy, I just found a way to get the toy. But I think the biggest thing that changed during this whole thing is kind of the other side of what you just said. I did. I started dreaming bigger. So before I used to think, oh, I want this, this, this. And now I'm just like, you know what? I want to go out there and I want to do much bigger things and doing much bigger things takes way more money. So I stopped putting a cap on how much money I want to make. And I started saying, if I put a cap on the amount of money I make, I literally have quit myself because once I hit to that point, I, I quit. So that's the biggest thing that changed in light of this. I've just started thinking that anything is possible and I can do anything. Cause if this is, if this is a hard time, then I need to help a lot of people. And in helping a lot of people, I'm helping myself. The, the Zig Ziglar thing is what did it for me. Help enough people get what they want and you will get what you want. So like the things, the cars, the running out and buying the thing you want, cause you think tomorrow's going to end. Okay. Well, you'll probably regret that, but going out there and helping other people get what they want first then you will you will literally live the most fulfilled life if you just live that one message. And that's what I'm doing now. And Love that's it. because of COVID, man, because of COVID. Love it. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I was, Gene, you got me thinking. Like, I, I, I don't know that there's really anything that I've, that I've changed because of COVID. I'm, I, I want to start another podcast where I can talk about other things. That's, that's about the main thing that's changed. There, there's, uh, about that. yep. those are, yeah, those are, those are plans that I already had in place that I, I, I was very tempted and nearly sped things up and launched another podcast this year, um, to start talking about some, some things. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's going to be my, my thing next year is when, when I have some things in place to where I can start talking openly about what I believe. Um, I'm sure I'm going to piss a lot of people off, but that was, that was the thing that COVID did for me. It was just like, nope, you can't, you can't, you're not, you're not allowed to sit on the sidelines anymore politically. Um, we're going to, you're going to have to take a stand one way or the other. And I know what stand I'm taking and, uh, and I'm going to start putting it out there. So that's, that was the thing that changed for me in COVID. I love that. I, I think it's amazing. I had a friend that a real good friend who's extremely successful and they decided to buy a second house down the shore and it was a big nut. And I knew that he was like, stressing about it. But I, but I said, and we were talking and I actually wrote it down. I could show it to you in my, in my book. We were on a call and he said, it just changed. And I started to think, what's my end game. And so I wrote down, what is my end game? Cause I was like, 
my wife and I have always talked about getting rid of everything, moving down in the center city, Philly, getting into one of those high rises on the 52nd floor and me riding a moped around the city while we go old, grow old. It would just be really fun. That's what we were going to do. But now I'm not going into the city. They yep. lost me. So I got to figure it out. And he asked me that question. What's your end game? And I was like, I actually have to reset. I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't. Yeah, I was going to say if I had that plan too, which I I did think about doing that in San Diego. We've been very fortunate here that they haven't completely screwed the city up yet. But yeah, if I if that was my plan and like getting into a condo in Philadelphia, I'd be making alternate plans too. I think there are a lot of people like that. Um, I mean, if you listen to, and I'm sure Chris, you probably know some of them. If there's people in New York City, especially there's people in California, all over California, Oregon, Washington that are going, I got to get the F out of here. Like I can't, I was going to retire here. This is going to be my, my dream home. You know, you've got celebrities moving out of Hollywood that have lived there for 40 years that are, that are moving outside the city, selling multi-million dollar mansions. You've got U-Hauls lining up in New York city. (laughs) They can't, they can't afford a U-Haul because they can't, they're having to outbid other people for it. Uh, yeah, it's strange times, but that's, that's a very, I think that's a very good question to ask ourselves uh, because if you had an end game that was dependent on things staying the same and just kind of cruising, that's, that's unfortunately not an option. Hmm. It's interesting. That is very interesting. I like the Hmm. standpoint you just said about taking a side and I've struggled with that sometimes because sometimes you're just trying not to be that one side or the other. And and I should kick myself in the ass for not just being the person I need to be and actually just taking that stand myself. It doesn't matter what people say. I don't need any more friends and I don't think any of us do. So who cares Mm -hmm. if people hate you? Well, it's getting to the point where half the country is going to hate you anyway. Yeah, that's Uh, true. And a certain half of the country will hate you even just for refusing to take a stand publicly, Um, which that that was the thing that really. I'm voting for Trump. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) Stand taken. Stand taken. Um, I wrote myself. It's it's been nice knowing you. (laughs) Gregory, shall we uh, shall we bring this to a close before we all start talking about who we're voting for? Yes, let's not do that. Uh, but <laughs> and, uh, and we uh, all get whisked away in dark panel vans. <laughs> hey, who are those guys in black suits down there? Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> I just heard my door open. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Chris, uh, I'm sure you already did it, but uh, tell us again your podcast name and where they can find you and uh, everything else. Yeah. So the real estate money school is the name of the podcast. It's been growing tremendously. Thanks to, you know, Matt and a lot of effort, but uh, if you want to learn more about this stuff you heard about today, cause it's, you know, kind of sparked an interest, go to chrisnoggle.com forward slash resources. And on there are tons of training videos, all free. And you can learn about everything we talked about today. And on that same website is my podcast. It is on guys, and not, that I'm not just here to blow you know air up uh, Matt's uh, Matt's skirt, Chris's skirt, but I do I do I do listen to the podcast, and it is legitimately good. Antonio said you have to watch this five times because your mind is bo- your mind is blown. Uh, guys, I've interviewed him at least I think four times at least, and he said the same thing over and over. And I'm just starting to gra- wrap my head around it. So please go get the podcast, go get the resources. I put the resources both in YouTube and in Facebook, so it's there, guys. Click the link. It is tremendously helpful information. And mm-hmm. um, Chris is a nice guy. He'll probably take your call. Matt won't take your call. Don't call Matt. He's no. That's, number right. One. no. That's right. And and just to sum up and tie this back to the title of the podcast, because it's about how the rich get richer. They do. Uh, but once I, I think you, you mentioned it, Greg, like just wrapping your, your brain around it, mm-hmm. it. It's a mindset. It's a mentality thing. And if you can get that part of it, you will be one of those ones that always continues to get richer and build wealth. Cause that like, that's the secret. That's why the rich get richer is because they think about things differently. And, uh, and yeah, that's what I love about what Chris has to say. And, um, yeah, I hope people go out, follow through and actually listen to this episode multiple times. Mm -hmm. Go listen to Chris's podcast. So you may not know this. Chris doesn't just interview people, by the way, Chris does episodes where he jumps on and talks about and goes deep on a topic for five to 10 minutes of something that's really, really useful and helpful. Um, so make sure to check out those particular episodes because that's where you really get into like the mindset stuff and not just having a chat with somebody else that's kind of doing these things, which is, which are great too. But I wanted to point out that, um, we don't do that much on real estate uncensored, um, do those, those shorter episodes where it's just one person, but make sure to go check out those episodes with Chris. So, okay. That being said, uh, let's do, so first of all, Gene, you have not let us know where we should contact and connect with you yet. So what is that? Listed like every other week. It's my website. I got a little widget on there, genevolpe.com. 
get to that. Uh, put your name in, your phone number, and your whatever, whatever, and we'll let's schedule a call. It's pretty easy. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. So bear, basically, there's a there's a nice barrier between you and uh, between the masses and and Gene's calendar, <laughs> which I like. It's very good. Uh, and then, Greg, what's the best way for people to reach out and connect with you? Barrier free, I assume. Barrier free, Matt. I I, I believe in love and cherishing ever you know everyone around me. So, yeah. shut up. Yeah, uh, you're, so, you're, a, you're a socialist with your time. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, you two clowns. Um, uh, guys, go ahead and just shoot me a call. 925-915-1978. Shoot me a text there. Uh, DM me on either Instagram or Facebook. Obviously, at Facebook, you're watching me, just Greg McDaniel. And then Instagram is Greg McDaniel, R-E-U for Real Estate Uncensored. And hit me up there. Follow me on everything. And let's we'll have a conversation. So there it is. Matt, I need you to do a big thing. I need you to tell them about your, your pamphlet, a.k.a. book, and how good it is and where they can get a free copy. And then we got to pick a, uh, put a bow on this bad boy. Yes. Okay. So microfamousbook.com. That's the place to get the book. And then for the color, uh, it actually works for both Gene and Chris because they both have the same brand colors, which is orange. So we're going to tie a nice orange bow upon this episode. Wrap it up, baby. Okay, guys, we love you to pieces. Thank you for taking your time to hang out with us today. We truly cherish you. Give us a five-star review on any podcasting app that you are listening to us on. And until next time, peace out, ninjas. We're gone.